The Bible uses a lot of agricultural language to help us understand our meaning and purpose in the church. When we think about the fields as it's described in Scripture, that typically refers to geographical areas. God is referred to as Lord of the harvest at least twice in the Gospels. The seed, the seed is the Word of God, the Gospel message that is planted, it's watered and nourished, and we watch it grow. Well, Johnny, what about us? Where do we fit in? We are God's workers. We are, in this analogy, we are field workers. Let me give you an example from Scripture. This is Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. Jesus said to His disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into His harvest field. That's Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. The significance of this agricultural language, I think, can be easily lost in today's society. Mainly because we're not an agrarian society. There was a time when people grew most of the food that they placed on their table to eat with their family. That's not the case today. There may be some that plant a garden each year out back of their house. There may be others of us, though, that our minds tend to think differently because we grew up as part of the industrial age. So we think in terms of machines and how machines work for the results and for the final product. Uh, others today may think in terms of technological age, and that's where we get this idea of instant gratification and immediate results because things can happen so quickly through this technology. Wow, it's a long way from the idea of agriculture, of plowing up that dirt, planting the seed, watering it, fertilizing it, and then watching it grow where the harvest comes in due time. We are called to be field workers. We're not called to be professionals. The truth of the matter is, I know some, some may be offended by this statement, but I want to speak truth today. The, the church doesn't need pew sitters. And what I mean by that is we don't need people who sit in the pew only. We're called to a greater commitment than that. We're not called to come and sit. We're commanded to go and tell. I think this statement is important. It says, the church needs people who will roll up our sleeves, sweat, and get our hands dirty. From a spiritual standpoint, from our work in the church, for this great commitment... We need people who will roll up our sleeves, sweat, and get our hands dirty, who will engage in the work of the church. The reality is, though, is that today's lesson, it's not going to have the appeal of the new iPhone 15 or the latest fashion trend. Uh, that's not what today's lesson is. Today's lesson is entitled The Great Commitment. I'll show you why in just a moment. But this lesson could have just as easily been called Grip the Plow. Because today we're talking about this agricultural language, this agricultural analogy where we put our hands to the plow, we roll up our sleeves, we sweat, and we get to work getting our hands dirty. The lesson, though, is entitled Great Commitment. Oh, I wonder. I wonder what would happen if, if we could catch the vision. Because the more I think about this, the more time I spend in prayer and study over this, I'm not sure that in my lifetime we have ever experienced the unity, the unity of purpose and mission, not to the degree of which we're called in Scripture. Now, there are people that work. There are people that do some great things in the church. Don't get me wrong. But my mission today in this message is much higher than that. I want to challenge us. What would it be like if everyone who calls himself or herself a Christian, 
everyone who calls themselves a member of the Malro church family, what would happen if every member of this church family put our hand to the plow? Can you imagine the harvest for the Lord? Can you imagine? The title of this series is called GC5. That actually gets us the title of today's lesson where this statement we've read several weeks now. We're going to read again today. The gospel of Christ gives us a great calling which requires a great commitment to the greatest commands and the great commission. The gospel of Christ gives us a great calling which requires a great commitment to the greatest commands and the great commission. So today our topic is the great commitment. What we're going to do today is we want to look in Luke chapter 9, going to be at the end of chapter 9, and we want to meet three prospective followers of Jesus. And we're going to hear these statements. I'll follow you wherever you go. But first, let me bury my father. And then, first, let me say goodbye. So we will unpack each of those statements from Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. That's coming up shortly. Uh, One of the things that we're going to see about these three is some things that they have in common. They all wanted to follow Jesus. As long as it didn't cost too much. They wanted Christianity with no strings attached. They wanted the benefits, but no requirements. They wanted to be inspired without a call for commitment. They wanted to attend, but not engage. They wanted to show up, but not step out. How did Jesus respond to people like that? That's what we'll see in Luke chapter 9. I think there is something that about Jesus that we often miss in the church today, and it's that Jesus called people to follow him. In the church today, unfortunately, I think we've we've really become content for people just to attend. It's like churches have run away from this biblical message of commitment. When I was a student at the University of Alabama, each fall, the beginning of each new school year, Uh, There were a number of churches in the area that would have advertisements in the local student newspaper. The University of Alabama student newspaper would be to let people know about their times of services, what they offered for college students, and things like that. There was one advertisement one year that really caught a lot of our attention. Uh, I didn't save the advertisement, but I do remember the gist of the message. The gist of the message was this, is whatever you're looking for, we've got it. If you want to be involved, we're your church. If you want to just sit in a pew on Sunday morning, then we're your church. I wonder, was was that church at least honest enough to put on paper, in writing, something that a lot of us live out in our congregations week in and week out. Oh, I have to admit to you, there are a a lot of Sundays that I desire to see more pews filled than empty. There's something exciting about seeing our building filled again. The sad thing, though, now here, here's the thing. My thinking isn't all bad. It's incomplete, but it's not bad. The idea of people coming together excites me. But if that is the end of our mission, then we have, we've really, we've, we've failed. We've missed something really important. Here's the thing, I want us to go the next step, because I want us to think about how Jesus responded to large crowds. So what I want to do is just for a moment think about John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, as far as recorded attendance, uh, this is going to be the largest crowd that came to Jesus at any point in the Gospels. 
we know that it was 5,000 men. Uh, Matthew chapter 14 will add to that. It's 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. As they came to him, what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus ministered to them. He ministered to them physically. He healed those who were sick. He ministered to them spiritually as he taught them. But then he noticed this, this huge need, and that was the fact that people were hungry, and it was getting late in the day. So Jesus fed the 5,000 people. The reason I wanted to stay in the Gospel of John, John chapter 6, is because John chapter 6 tells us about the next day. The next day, they came back. In all fairness, I don't understand why the other three Gospels don't mention this, but they've chosen not to, and that's under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, so I won't question that very much. But I am so thankful that John chose to include this in his Gospel account. What happened the next day? Well, Jesus kind of called them on it. John chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. And Jesus just called them on it. He said, it's one thing when you were coming and you're wanting to learn and you have genuine needs and you're you had a good meal yesterday, and, and you just came back for more. So what Jesus did is he began to teach them, to feed them spiritually. Part of that sermon involved this statement in verse 35 where Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus continued to teach, and he continued to talk, and, and it was a difficult it was a hard lesson. In fact, that's the language that's used in chapter 6, verse 60. When people were listening to it and they responded to Jesus, they said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Man, Jesus, what do you do? You've got this huge crowd here. You've got a chance to really have something here. And that's not the way Jesus thought about this. Jesus wanted to call them to commitment. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Six verses later, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. What do we do with that? If we were the disciples, if we were John and, and Peter and James and Andrew, how would we look at this? Because one moment, the, the fields, this whole area, it just looked like a sea of humanity. And by the end of this verse, you could hear the crickets chirp. But Jesus knew what he was doing. I think that's in something that we don't need to miss at all. Jesus wanted to know who was serious about following him. It was not necessarily Jesus' goal to make them feel welcome. It was his goal to call them to a mission. There was a time, there is a time, when we need to step across the line where we have been a curious observer, but it's time to step over the line and make a commitment to the cause of Christ. And that's what Jesus did in John chapter 6. And so I wonder in the midst of our holding back today what has happened because you know, we've become content for people to attend rather than to engage. And things like that. Well, I think part of the result is this, is that the most miserable people on Sundays are those who try to keep one foot in the world and the other in the church. They're miserable. And sometimes it's even obvious as I stand in the pulpit and I look out over our congregation. It becomes really clear of some people that just don't want to be there, but they know they need to be there. They've, they've always been there. They know the importance of church and of scripture and of prayer and of following Jesus. But boy, they still like to put a foot in the world. So they're trying to hold on to the best of both worlds, and as a result of that, they are just absolutely miserable. One of the things we think about when we talk about the faithfulness of people in the church is we think about the faithfulness of their attendance. 
and I think we should look much deeper than that. I think we should challenge our church much deeper than that. You know, we need to be concerned with how many people come to worship, who come to receive the message. But we also need to be concerned with how many are being sent out each Lord's Day, sent out on a mission to share the gospel with others in their community. All right, we need to get to Luke chapter 9 because we need to meet these three perspective followers. I think the idea of things we've just talked about, it's, it's going to continue, and we will understand more as we meet these three individuals. Uh, the first one we meet is in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 and 58. As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay His head. The Son of Man has no place to lay His head. Key statement, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, that sounds like a commitment, doesn't it? Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. I think the reason Jesus answered this the way that he did is it's his way of, of asking the man, but do you understand where wherever is? Because in this case, wherever involves not having a home. And Jesus wanted to make sure that he understand that. I think at this point, the man was brought to a crossroads. That he had to decide whether he wanted to choose a life of comfort, or a life of commitment to the Lord. Our crossroads today is going to look very similar. Is do we want a life of comfort or a life of commitment to the Lord? Because they're not always going to go together, and at some point we have to make a decision between one of the two. I know some, again, some of you won't agree with me on this, but I think we're seeing this more and more and more. It's that our crossroads may look something like this. Is are we going to follow the Lord's dream for us, or are we going to follow the American dream? Because what we're seeing more and more is that those two roads are not the same road. Are we going to follow the Lord's will, seeking out His plans, His dreams for us, how He desires us to live? Are we going to follow that path of the American dream? We remember Jesus' words from Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This has to be one of the most unappealing images that Jesus could have put before the crowd. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Take up their cross. There was nothing about a picture of a cross that was appealing in that day. It was a sign of death. It was a sign of crucifixion. It was a sign of someone who had lived a horrible life and they were being punished for their for their crimes, for their evil deeds. They were being put to death. There's nothing appealing about this, but that is how Jesus chose to call His disciples. He, the man came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. I will follow you wherever you go. And I think Jesus needed him to understand where, wherever might lead. People will say with their words, their actions, or both, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. I think this is so true. I'll follow you wherever you go. As long as wherever you go is where I was headed. Do you understand the difference? Lord, I'm going to follow you as long as it's comfortable. I'll follow you as long as it's convenient. But the minute that it's not, then we might have some rub. That's what, and none of us will necessarily say that out loud. But again, that's what, I, whether it's the conversation going on up here, uh, whether it's the way that just we respond, 
the way we act, because our actions tell an awful lot about us. I just wonder, it, are, are we understanding today, if we were to say to Jesus, Jesus, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. What if wherever meant going down the hallway to teach a children's class? I'll follow you wherever you go, right, to teach a children's class. Well, what if it involved going to the back of the auditorium, to the sound booth? Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. What if it's to go to the nursery to care for our children during worship, to take a time there? Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. What if I'll follow you wherever you go, the wherever is that we need to go home. We need to be a spiritual leader in our family. What if wherever you go, that wherever is our neighborhood, of where we need to strive to have an impact on others for the cause of Christ. And that wherever involves inviting them to come to worship with. What if that wherever is actually sitting down at a table and learning how to study the Bible with someone so that we can go to their home or to our home or somewhere to sit down and study the Bible with someone to learn how to help someone come to a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Will we follow the Lord wherever He goes? That's why I think it's important for us to stand, understand where, wherever may be. Let's meet the second individual, the second perspective follower of Jesus in chapter 9, verse 59. Uh, Jesus said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Most commentators agree, by the way, that this guy's father may not have been old, may not have even been ill. But what this guy was saying, uh, according to some commentators, I think there's a lot of merit to this, by the way, is that what he was saying to Jesus is, Jesus, you know, when my father dies, I'll receive the inheritance. When I receive the inheritance, I'll be comfortable. And when I'm comfortable, then I will come and follow you. Is he saying, let me wait to a more opportune time? Now, we see this, and I have to tell you, any sentence that we see or that we say that says, first, let me, we're headed down a, a rough road at that point. All right, so we, we see this language in society today. We, we talk to people about making a serious commitment to Christ, but it's a student who says, and Lord, first, let, let me get through high school. Let me get through college. Let me get my education so that I can get settled in that first job. But then the young professional says, I, I, I'm settled in my job, but I, I, like, this, uh, I like this girl, and we're going to get married. We're going to establish a family. Let me get my family settled down, and, and then, then, Lord, I, I'm all in. There are, there are, by the way, there are some people that do ultimately make that commitment to the Lord. Now, a lot don't. They keep, uh, Lord, let me get through my career. Let me retire. When I retire, everything will be good. And next thing you know, our, our life has been spent. And I think that's the big point that I want to make, is that as long as we keep stretching this out, of making these excuses and saying, Lord, not right now. Really, what we're saying, and we need to hear this, is, Lord, what we're saying is that, Lord, you're not, you're not our top priority. Oh, Johnny, that's not what I'm saying. Yes, it is. When we say, but first I got to get my education, then I'll get serious. Let me get my family settled, then I'll get serious. Let me get this going, and then I'll commit to the Lord. When we keep making those excuses, we're kicking the can down the road, and we're saying, Lord, you're just not that important right now. First, let me get this together. Anytime we see that phrase, first let me. By the way, we're going to see it one more time here. And we meet this third perspective follower in Luke 9, 61. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. 
Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Do you understand the idea of grip the plow? Uh, anyone who puts his hand to the plow, looks back, is not fit for the service in the kingdom of God. So, if we don't get a good understanding of this passage, we might look at this thing and, and say, wow, Lord, um, that doesn't sound right. If, if you'll allow me, let me... Uh, let me explain it this way. When Angie and I got married, just like many of, of, of you have done, in the time when we exchanged vows, uh, part of that exchange of vows involves this phrase, and forsaking all others, keep myself only for you as long as we both shall live. Forsaking all others. Now, is that just my way of being mean to other people? Oh, I'm saying no to you, saying no to you, forsaking all others. It's, that, that's not really what it's about, is it? It's not just that I'm saying no to others. I'm saying in, in, in the case of marriage, I'm saying yes to Angie. I'm telling Angie, you are just that important to me. I am establishing that level of priority and commitment to you. Same thing in the church. That whenever we say no to these other things, is it that we're being, is, is it our way of being rude or condescending or, or whatever to, to other things? No, but what it understands and what it sets is a priority and a commitment because we're saying yes to the Lord. Lord, you come first. Lord, I'm making a commitment to you. Lord, forsaking all others, forsaking everything else, I will follow you. We make this great commitment. Maybe some of us today need to make it. We thought about it. We've never been able to make that decision and cross over the line. Maybe today you need to make that great commitment and follow Jesus Christ. And be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're ready to make that decision, I hope that you will respond, that you will move upon that desire and, and do it today. Do it today. Reach out to someone today and make that decision to follow Jesus. Now, for others of us, we've made that decision. And what I want to do today is to, to leave us with something that is a practical challenge as I can because we looked at three prospective followers of Jesus and, and, and each of them were some degree were trying to make a commitment to the Lord, but it, it just fell short. But I want us to think in terms of just very practically of making a commitment to the Lord. We're going to do that with one sentence. And I hope that you will help me because each of us needs to do this individually. We want to fill in the blank to this question. The, the question or the sentence actually is, is I will commit to, and this is where you have to fill it in. So if you have a copy of our outline today, you have that at the bottom of your page. And if not, all you got to do is grab a, a piece of paper and just write this down. I will commit to. And then you complete the sentence. Now, I don't want to tell you what to write. That's not my goal today. But what I would like to do is to just share some things that other people around the country, that other Christians around the country, commitments that they are making as we strive to understand this great, Commitment to the Lord. I will commit to. I will commit to pray for a different co-worker each week. I will commit to feed hungry families in my community. Again, these don't have to be your answers. I'm just giving you something to help, help feed some thought. I will commit to increase my giving by. And again, you've got to fill in the blank there. I will commit to invite all my neighbors to church by the end of the year. Put a timeline on that commitment. That way you're, you, you know this is not something you just continue to kick down the road. I, I like that idea of putting a timeline on that. I will commit to read God's Word daily, beginning today. I will commit to take the next step to become 
a foster parent. It's a great need in our county and in our community. I will commit to set aside a day each week to pray for the lost people in our community. Or this one final thought, or I will commit to ask at least one person a week, how can I pray for you? Again, those are just some ideas. I, I'm not telling you what to write in your blank. That's something you've got to do. But I ask you to do this. Please make that commitment today. Please write it down. And I know you're sitting there, I'm not going to write it. Well, if you don't write it down, then you're probably not going to follow through with it either. But if you write it down, you've got to look at it. You're likely to follow through with it. So I hope that you'll accept that challenge. I want to remind you of this verse as we leave our time together today. John chapter 4, verse 35. It's where Jesus said, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. That's the important. This, this is a message for today. Because this is not a message that says that the fields are were ripe for the harvest. It's not a message that says one day they will be ripe for the harvest. No, the fields are ripe for the harvest. There are people that are waiting today to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. But we've got to make the commitment. We've got to make the commitment to be workers in God's field. We've got to be willing to roll up our sleeves and to sweat and to get our hands dirty as we seek to carry out the cause of Christ.